Jerry was born into a family of Hindus at a time when to become a teacher, only Christians were permitted. Many families, including the Jagans, adopted Christian names. Hi there, Carl Brown here with you, welcoming you back to another edition of my YouTube channel. Sure, let's go into my time tunnel, like, subscribe, and see what's behind there for you. Hi there, welcome back again. Yes, it is. And um, today we're looking at part two of that series, which I started with Chedi Jagan at 100 The Legacy. Today we're looking at uh, the voice and uh, hearing the views of Mr. Eric Huntley. Um, he is another one of the individuals who was on the program and spoke highly of Dr. Chedi Jagan. Um, a little bit about Eric Huntley before we get into what he has to offer. Eric Huntley was a founding member of the People's Progressive Party, which came to government in the country's first election based on universal adult suffrage in April 1953. He arrived in England in the 1950s and became active in political and social issues relating to the British American Caribbean communities with his late wife, Jessica. For over 50 years, the Huntleys participated in many of the significant grassroots campaign within the community. Now, there's so much more Eric has done, but I'll say no more and I'll bring you Mr. Eric Huntley's views on the life of Dr. Chetty Jagan, looking back at Chetty Jagan at 100 The Legacy. Uh, it gives me a feeling of tremendous responsibility and of course as I'm very humble to be here today. However, despite the remit that I've been given, I'm going to restrict myself mainly to my own experience. And uh, I admit some of it will be anecdotal. In the campaign of Chedi during the early 1950s, I'm sure that many of you here today will also have your own stories to tell. When I left Guyana, I told friends I was going to study dentistry, just like Chedi. However, I did not become a dentist, but ended up writing a biography of him for the young reader. On this occasion, I need to take a different look at my hero, even if it departs from my brief. During the 1940s and 50s, virtually all the professional middle class <coughs> were mainly doctors and lawyers, including the Lapus, Devadin, Burnham, Lachman Singh, Eliezer, and many others. It is significant that all of them hitched their wagons to the workers' struggles, and in doing so, they sought political leg legitimacy by aligning with the trade unions. Jagan also sought to, do, to hold office in the Sawmill Workers' Union and the Manpower Citizens Association. However, the class he came from and the profession he chose did not provide him satisfactorily with the rigor and the knowledge ne needed to fulfill these roles. To understand the role he played during the 1950s, we have to catch a glimpse of his upbringing <coughs> as a youngster and growing up in Portland, and which appeared to be more benevolent than many others. Jerry was born into a family of Hindus at a time when to become a teacher, only Christians were permitted Many families, including the Jagans, adopted Christian names. Cherry chose Beret. Other members of his family were known as Derek, Doris, Patricia, and Barbara. Cherry recalled going to the plantation manager's house as a child, which was a castle compared to the logies that they grew up in, and the manager's wife would stand on the balcony of her, of her castle and throw pennies to the peasants, to the children. She was reenacting a medieval practice when the lords of the manor in England 
threw coins to the peasants on Monday, Thursday. A school days in the neighboring village of Rose Hall was not as traumatic as his years in at Queen's College. The older generation of Guyanese like myself would recall that city folk called the postpersons <coughs> from the rural areas as country boo-boo. <laughs> Jenny lacked what was regarded in certain social spaces, in certain, certain social circles, the social graces that students at Queen's College took for granted, such as eating with a knife and fork, wearing leather shoes, riding a bicycle, and his accents and the idiom were handicaps. He lived with three families while in Georgetown, two of whom were Hindus. However, it was the third, who was also a Hindu, but converted to Catholicism, that he was most comfortable with. All three families were from the higher class, while Jagans were kumi, kumi, kumis, a, a lower class. He could not <coughs> wait to return home during the holidays to rekindle his roots, assisting in household chores, swimming in the canal, milking cows, and helping to harvest the, the rice. Life in the United States of America, where he spent seven years, was also challenging. For the first time, he would be faced with blatant racism, regarding, regarded as neither black nor white, though he was occasionally treated as an honorary white. As we say in Guyana, on top of all that, he decided to marry someone of the Jewish faith whose parents did not like him. He was aware of the deficiencies in his academic choices he made. While as a student at Queens, Queens and at Northwestern University, his studies did not include the humanities. While studying dentistry, he felt he was being trained as a technician, is what he said, and as a craftsman. To his credit, he did something about these perceived deficiencies and enrolled for evening classes in civics at the YMCA. He embraced the Marxist determinism in economics, but paid little or no attention to the role of social and cultural issues. Having qualified, he returned home to find that his choice of wife was not initially welcomed by the family. He also found it difficult to assimilate into the social life of the Creole professional middle class. He and I suppose Janet as well were bored of the chit chat and the gossip of city life. Although he lived in the city for the rest of his life, the Jagans never was comfortable in Georgetown. The founding of the discussion circle and later the Political Affairs Committee, which met at the Carnegie Library, the precursors of the People's Progressive Party, provided the grit of intellectual conversations he yearned for. With the founding of the party in 1950, his surgery became the engine room, with Janet in the early days combining the role of secretary and dental nurse. As a dentist, Jerry had an opportunity to put into practice his socialist principles. For one thing that was certain, he was not a doctrinaire socialist. The fees paid by the well-off helped to subsidize those of the poor. He was a poor man's dentist. I did not pay for my extractions. Our lives in Guyana could not have existed in, in isolation, and the events following the Second World War were to have a dramatic effect on our lives. Millions of people throughout the world, having experienced the horrors and the devastation of the war, became genuinely concerned about the peaceful resolution of issues rather than conflict. Peoples from the colonial empires of Europe who added their voices for self-determination. In this cauldron of aspirations, the Soviet Union was to play a pivotal role becoming a beacon for the progressive movements of people from many parts of the world. 
This led to the holding of organization, founding of organizations representing young people, trade unionists, and women. Millions of people organized under the banner of World Peace Councils, of which I was a member. Many conferences and festivals were held in Eastern Europe and other parts of the world. The expenses of delegates were paid by the hosts. One of the significant contributions during this period was the founding of the University of Columba in Moscow, which provided free university education for hundreds of students in the third world. With Cherry election to the legislature in 1947, and his brother Sir Paul qualifying as a dentist, and Cherry paid for the fees for all his, all his brothers and sisters to become trained and professional people. Cherry paid it. Cherry was able, as Sir Paul joined the, the surgery, Cherry was able to spend more time <coughs> in politics abroad and so on. For many of my generation who could not undertake the trips overseas to broaden our minds, we had only the cinema to connect us with the outside world. The diet consisted of Tarzan, the spoilers, Captain Marvel, and John Wayne. Herbert Nathaniel Critchlow, the founder of the first trade union to be legally recognized by the British Empire, visited the Soviet Union and was impressed with what he saw. Hubbard, J.M. Hubbard, a trade unionist, owned a bookshop in Georgetown and sold Chedi his first copy of Palm Dutt's The Problem of India. Palm Dutt was an active member and one of the most intellectual giants to the Communist Party in England. After I became a founder member of the People's Progressive Party in 1950, a whole new world of literature was made available by Chedi. Writers such as Gorky, Turgenev, Tolstoy, Puskin, Dostoevsky, Karl Marx and Lenin, the diet, the literary chart and literary classes of Europe, that's what they read, was made available to me and, and to many like us. Together with Steinbeck, Howard Fast from America, Robert Barons, Man's Worldly Goods, booklets from the United, United States, The Progressive Man, opened up new vistas in our imagination. Although I was able to read Candide, provided by the British Council while being a guest of Her Majesty's prison, the British government policy kept us ignorant of the literature which could elevate our minds, was soon demonstrated. Lionel Locke, a barrister and ardent anti-communist, introduced a bill in the local legislature banning the importation of subversive literature, regarded by us colonials as the dumps bill. Books were confiscated from my home and that of other radicals. Thousands of copies awaiting the clearance at the customs and excise were dumped in the Demerara River. Such an action should not be seen in isolation. The Nazis did the same thing in Germany and others since then. When the bill was introduced in the Legislative Council, the lone voice of Chevy Jagan stood out, and he spoke against the bill in a marathon session, breaking speech of several hours to no avail. <coughs> However, he did not allow that experience to deter him from educating us. In 1947, Jagan was elected to the legislature, which enabled him to access documents such as the government and committee reports, annual accounts of, of companies, the who own what in Guyana. He became a literal thorn in the, in the, established, to the established order. He published much of this information in a booklet called Bitter Sugar, primarily exposing the role that bookers played in all aspects, aspects of our lives. For this to be understood, it is important to recall that British Guiana, abbreviated BG, also stood for Booker's Guyana. Incidentally, it was Booker's which financed the prestigious Booker's Literature Prize during the 1980s, $80,000, the highest um, prize um, for literature in those days. 
the sweat and the blood of the enslaved and indentured laborers were used to raise the profile of the forum in the name of philanthropy, which also included the Street Polytechnic in Hoburn. During the campaign for the general elections in 1953, I had the opportunity of accompanying Chedi. We stayed at each other's houses in Port Morant and in Rosignol, where I lived, and spoke at meetings in many parts of the country using the contents of bitter sugar, which was relevant to people's lives. In 1953, during the general elections, Chedi hardly spoke about the Soviet Union. The benefits of cooperatives in providing machinery to plow the land and to harvest the rice, as it was done in the Soviet Union, it was considered a good idea. And if we had an opportunity, we should implement that kind of cooperative. He made a deliberate effort of not visiting the Hindu temples, partly because many of the pundits were also substantial landowners and he did not want to be seen too closely associated with them. He somehow did not feel comfortable doing so. Today, as I speak, we have the privilege of looking back in hindsight. This provides me with an opportunity referring to an act which as leader of the party and the business of the legislature fell on Chedi's shoulders. One of the resolutions passed in the assembly in 1953, sought clemency for Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. The older generation may remember this incident. Convicted of treason, no. the Rosenbergs were convicted of treason and sentenced to death in the United States of America. Such a resolution helped to confirm the left-wing sympathies of the party and the government, which, without, which was without substance. It was used as an ammunition against us and placed our fragile movement in unnecessary danger. Having placed, this, having placed this act into the open, I must confess that I do not recall any dissent from members. We all supported the resolution, but it was not the place of the government to take such action. We were all very immature, including our leader. Chedi possessed the frailties of all of us. One night, a group of us were on our way home from, meeting, from a meeting in Charlotte Street when we saw a woman be, bereaved with all her worldly goods thrown in the street. It appears the bailiff had executed a court order to, of, for rent arrears. Chedi, without hesitation, gathered the woman's belongings and placed them back into the house. He was later to pay a very heavy fine for such an action. Good intentions are not enough. Neither is a degree in humanities. While the late President Chedi Jagan broke the mold of not coming from a pedigree of middle class professionals, his commitment in advancing the cause of working people is unquestioned. He also provided over the most divisive period in the modern history of the country. I refer to the events in 1962-63, during which, in order to remain in office, he invited the very troops which deposed his government a decade earlier, in 1953, he invited the imperialist Britain troops from them to come and maintain order. The role played by the government of the United States of America and Britain was divisive and, and anti-Jagan, which was to be expected, but does not alter the substance of which lie, where the opportunity lies. It laid with Chile. The event of these two years acerbated the existing polarization of the two major communities, leading to a virtual breakdown of the social fabric of the country and the hemorrhaging of the population in its thousands. In 1964, he allowed Duncan Sands, the arch enemy, his arch enemy, to decide on the issue of electoral voting at the Constitutional Conference. This must be seen as the nadir of his whole career. I remember Brindley Ben, Minister of the Government and a member of the delegation, coming to us to see us in Walton School. Brindley was bereft. 
How lonely Chedi must have felt. No consultation whatsoever with his delegation. I'm reminded of a visit he paid to my home in Ealing during the early 80s. It was intended to be a social evening in the company of John LaRose, Darko Sao, Leila Hassan, Carlos Moore from Cuba, Jessica, and of course others. As Chedi was about to leave, he remarked that he wished the kind of discussions we had could have taken place at home in Guyana. To some extent, and that of, to some extent, his and that of Burnham's failure are also my, my, my um, failure, and perhaps all of ours, for not bringing unity to our bifurcated country. In closing, I wish to take the liberty, since I'm neither a historian nor an academic, to inquire of the audience whether you do believe that in the, in the, in, whether you do, you do believe that luck plays a part in human affairs. Do you believe in luck? If you do, Shelley was unlucky. And his unluckiness continues to pay, we continue to pay the price of him being unlucky. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to like, subscribe, and join me next again when we meet again for another edition of my YouTube channel. And let's go behind my time tunnel. Carl Brown saying it was a pleasure being with you.